Say, well, see, there's these two brothers. It's like Cain and Abel on a high school basketball team. And there's this girl in the middle, but there's this other girl, and there's this father and this mother, and then there's this coach. And then there's an uncle. And when the other mother comes back, and an uncle who's very important to the one boy, but not so much to the other. And then... Creator slash producer slash mastermind. How did a feature script called An Unkindness of Ravens become One Tree Hill? Um, it's a good question four years later, that's for sure. I met Mark three years before we ever did One Tree Hill, and he was working on a movie, and the name of the movie was Ravens. Joe sort of uh, read An Unkindness of Ravens at a very early stage. I actually felt weird about showing it to someone because I loved it so much, but it wasn't done. He had given me like 10, 11 pages to read of it, and I started to read it, and I really loved it. And it got very close to getting made around town, but eventually it just didn't find its way. He really wanted to do it as a movie, and honestly, I kept on checking with him for three years until one day he said, okay, I'll write it as a TV show. You love it so much, why spend two hours in this world? Why not spend 22 hours a year in this world? Remember, 20 shots, no less. Got it, Dad. Quit yakking and warm up. When I read this script, it was called Ravens. I was just coming out of high school, so... Yeah, I had just finished my junior year in college. I remember them calling me and saying that they needed a replacement for one of the characters. The audition process for me was pretty brutal. Completely uh, aggravating and nerve-wracking. Remember I had put my hair into two little buns on either side. I thought it was very kind of cute and quirky and Haley. And then my note for the screen test was, you got a screen test, come on in. Don't wear your hair like that. I was like, OK. It's hot and muggy. There's bugs, but I haven't been bitten yet. So welcome to Wilmington, North Carolina, people. The most interesting thing in reference to it starting out as a feature is I knew what I wanted the first episode to be. I knew what I wanted the second episode to be. But then I was kind of tapped out at that point. I was like, all right, where are we going? And so it evolved, you know, and it became more about the love triangles and more about, um, you know, Lucas's relationship to these people in this new world, this basketball arena that he's now entered. When I read Lucas's character, I just thought there was something wholesome and beautiful about him and he always rose above everything. He seemed incredibly intelligent and well-spoken and I think the Lucas that was on the pilot and on the river court is the same Lucas that's going to end the show. He's seen all these things in his life and he has realized many of his mistakes but in the end, you know, Lucas the good guy is always going to be there. Lucas, care to respond and describe Peyton? Lonely. Lucas and Peyton were always planned. And if you remember, Peyton was with Nathan. So we knew that we, we actually, I designed it more as a Lucas, Nathan, Peyton what do you want? love triangle. What do I want? What do you want, man? I mean, other than my girlfriend and my spot in the lineup. Hey. Your art matters. It's what got me here. I think Lucas and Peyton is that relationship that you know has to be destined. You know, I think they're destined to be together. They have so much in common, so many similarities. They said, why do you want Hillary Burton? And my answer was, she has a lot of pain in her eyes. And I want that pain in Peyton's eyes. We always laugh about it because Hillary's like, it's a good thing a lot of crummy things happen to me in my life. I have wanted this for so long. Me too. And now? Can have it. I want us. I want to have everything with you. Why can't you just leave it alone? Hey. Sophia Bush's character, Brooke, wasn't in the pilot, uh, but we added her, you know, shortly thereafter. All their characters at the moment are very depressing, and they want to bring in someone who's funny. You know, Peyton, I know you're all Gwen Stefani, plaid skirt, I'm badass, but we love you anyway. Sophia's uh, audition for Brooke was really interesting. Mark was terrible. He, he made me wait in his office, and he comes in, and you know, so if I just, I just gotta ask you a question. And I'm going, what did I do wrong? 
I mean, we nailed that. I know we nailed that. What? I... And he goes, it's, it's a hard one. It's, it's a hard question. And he looks at me and he goes, so do you want to move to Wilmington? And I was like, Mark, you're such an ass. She was the one character in the early days that wasn't carrying around the weight of the world. Brooke was brought in to stir the pot and, and kind of spice up the show. The sign says boys, doesn't it? Okay, whoa. Oops. You know, she, she came in here with this very inherent spark, but it came from her being a little mischievous, you know, her being a bad girl with a heart of gold. And I said, you know, that would be attractive to Lucas. You know, Lucas and Brooke was kind of that fun thing, that fun moment that took Lucas outside of himself and caused him to be careless for a little bit. I love you. But once again, you can't, you can't stop. You, you go right back to who Lucas is. Hey, hey. It's you. What? When all my dreams come true, the one I want next to me. It's you. Nathan and Lucas, you know, have always known that they were, they were brothers, um, but they were never friends. I can describe Lucas in one word. Bastard. All right, all right, all right, all right. And I think since then, you know, Nathan and Lucas have really evolved into more of a brotherhood, you know? And I think once they formed that brotherhood, nothing really could break that, and they still had each other's backs. Nathan was sort of the villain that we first met in the beginning, in the feature. Before I actually got the part, I thought to myself, you know, if I get this role, then, you know, I've made it, this is it. I said to him, look, you're gonna play the villain. Nathan is a bad guy. He's gonna do really crummy things. He's gonna say crummy things. He's gonna treat girls poorly. He's gonna hate the hero. All skills broke out, the old Raven's game footage. <laughs> I swear, when I watch it, it doesn't even feel like me. I should hope not. You are such a jerk. I hope in time they realize, like, if I do a good job with Nathan, I hope in time they realize that I, there's more to him than just being a mean guy. He's got a lot of levels that he operates on. And I said, but if you commit to that, it'll give me some place to take this character, and it'll be a wonderful place, I promise you. Right, I screw up a lot, all right? And being around you, I just, I don't want to be that guy anymore. And for me, it was always planned, Nathan and Haley. But for the fans, it was very unexpected. Nathan and Haley is a beautiful relationship. Uh, I, I love watching it. He really only started, you know, dating Haley or, or becoming interested in Haley to, to sort of get inside Lucas's head. What really happened is that Nathan ended up falling for Haley and it ended up becoming very genuine. Well, Nathan and Haley is the oldest story in the world. The bad boy changes his behavior for the love of a good woman. Um, yeah, I love Nathan and Haley, and um, James has just been so amazing to work with. So it's been really fun to sort of create those characters and see, you know, navigate the crazy waters that are Nathan and Haley, all the crazy adventures and drama that they go on. And um, I really enjoy our, our comedic scenes, our comedy stuff. It's just so fun Haley. for me. And you freak out after we have sex for the first time in God knows how long. And by the way, I know exactly how long it was. And frankly, I'm still pissed off at you about that whole birth control thing. What? Haley, you can't go to Duke, because I'm going to Stanford. Good sign or bad? They have this love that I don't ever see going away. I think if it did, everybody would be pissed. Yeah, you know, we, we've been described as the little show that could. Our ratings weren't very good. Our ratings were so low. I don't think I ever was, you know, confident enough to say that we would be back for, you know, the next season. Oh, God, not after the first few weeks. We thought we'd be here for, uh, for maybe nine episodes and we thought we were going home. I used to say to everyone, look, my parents don't even know that our show is on the air right now. But it was incredible because our, our little ratings that they told us were not enough kept growing. But the ratings started inching up one week after another. And by the eighth week, we had gotten enough traction that the network felt like it was something that they wanted to hold on to. So let's not pull the plug on what we set out to do. Let's believe in what we set out to do, and let's believe that we're going to find our way. I'm not worried about it. No, I always told everybody. A lot of people were paranoid that we'd get canceled or we'd get lost in the clutter of all the new shows and high concepts. But there's a heart on this show, and the cast and the crew and everybody works so hard to 
should keep it going. So no, never at one point did I ever go, that ah, we're not gonna make it. Never once. As Mark always says, you know, we might not want to be the biggest show, or we might not become the biggest show, but we'll always become somebody's favorite show. I'm really grateful that I haven't gone home yet. <laughs> oh, damn!